Well, welcome to On Demand. I want to say I'm glad you're with me today. We're going to talk about courageous conversations between two friends. It's a powerful moment when God speaks to the Apostle Paul and he challenges the Apostle Peter. It's a great time. You know, I use the big titles today, Apostles, because the Apostles, the big dogs, are going to have some conversations that's going to be helpful. And it's going to be something that lifts their life to a new place. Sometimes in life, you're blind, can't see. That's what this whole series has been about, willful blindness. You've chosen not to look, but there's a friend sometime that will step into your life or someone that you know and say, can we have a conversation, a courageous conversation that helps you change your life forever? So let's get to it. It's going to be a great study. Stay right there. I'll be back and pray for you at the end. So don't leave. Enjoy today's message. Well, glad you're with us today, back with us. I'm so happy that you've joined me for this courageous conversation we're going to have today. Every now and then in life, you have moments with people, right? Moments where you have a need to talk because things are out of whack. I don't know what caused it to be out of whack. I don't know who did it. I don't know who brought the challenge, but you have it. So you're trying to work it out. In the book of Galatians, um, Paul said a lot of things. And this is a great book to study. But in this book, he, he recounts an encounter that he had with one of the most famous apostles or leaders in, in the day. It was Peter. And Peter was the guy who walked with Jesus. Peter was the guy who walked on the water. Peter was the guy who was a true Jew. And he did not really have a history of dealing with Gentiles. But when the church came and he started ministering across ethnic lines and he saw Jesus reach across the ethnic lines, it was the first time he had to really, quote, deal with Gentiles up close. And for Jews, that was a big deal. They just didn't deal with them at all. And so there are moments in this study I'm going to share with you that you're going to see three powerful things that illustrate how God led Peter to a better way of thinking. And but it starts with a courageous conversation. This guy was blind. He didn't see it in himself. Now, he could have seen it, but he couldn't see it. And he kind of reverts back to this. Um, I won't use the word racist because that's kind of like not what I want to say. This is a guy that was racially and ethnically insensitive. Some of you say, you're just playing with words, Pastor Rick, playing with words. Yeah, I know you say that, that's fine, but this is my sermon, so here's what I'm going to say. I believe this was a guy whose heart was right. That's why God chose him. This was a guy who meant well. That's why God chose him. This was not a guy who was just trying to be mean. He was trying to be holy. And some people really think that being holy means you don't interact with certain people. You don't cross certain lines. And, and there's this effort. You see it in this chapter, in Galatians chapter 2. You see it in Acts chapter 10. If you want to read that on your own, it's a great study. Where, where P Peter was constantly being approached about being more open-minded across ethnic lines. And if, before I read the text, if I can just say this as a black guy. One of the great gifts in my life is cross-cultural relationships. Being able to love people no matter what color they are, where they came from. And being able to admit, okay, you white and I be black, okay? And we be not totally the same in every way. And that, but that's okay. We don't have to be the same. We have the same God. And so in this study, Peter is being a hypocrite. He's pretending to like people when he's with them. But when he's not with them, he, you know, it's like, okay, I don't, I don't know you people. And he's being a hypocrite. And I, I really think that religious people are good at that. Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. Wow, can we pretend? Can we just fake it till we make it? I mean, man, I mean, I'm telling you what, you just can pretend. Oh, praise the Lord. I just, good to see you. No, you don't mean that. You struggle with people. Struggle with, you struggle with women. Some men are gender, or they're, they're, they're truly chauvinistic. They don't like women. They want to all be like men. And some women, you listen, ladies, you know how you can be. When you talk about men and nobody around, you look left, you look right, you say, they don't know how to think. And you're bobbing your head and making comments you hope he don't hear. Or some of you don't care that he hear it, right? I know, because you're a bad sister. My point is, bias is everywhere. Baptists don't like the Pentecostals. The Pentecostals think the Baptists need to come to Jesus. And the Catholics think the Presbyterians and the Lutherans. Everybody's got some opinion. It's, you guys, we are a mess. And, and in this study, you see it revealed. The whole study I've been on so far has been talking about refusing to see. And then I talked about willful blindness, the price tag for not seeing. I talked about all of these issues 
where people refuse to see themselves. And a lot of it was wrapped around the book of Galatians. It's a great example of it. And one of the things that that does is it traps us. It's one of the answers to the question for the year. Remember I told you, why don't people do what they say they're going to do? It's because they are willfully blind. Why people don't do what they say they're going to do? They're willfully blind. They, they, they choose to not see. The whole series has been designed to help you see that. So here's what helps that end, at least hopefully in Peter's life. It doesn't quite work, but it's a powerful beginning conversation. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. Listen carefully. When Cephas came to Antioch, I, Paul speaking, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. Before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to withdraw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Now, I want to say this to you. This is a classic moment where Peter, when no Jews are around who came from James, which was the leader of the church, when they came from Jerusalem and they came down to Antioch, he, he said, um, he was, he was uh, he, I, I, I don't know those, uh, those Gentiles. He acted like he didn't know who the Gentiles were. But when, the, when they left, he hung out with the Gentiles. And that was hypocrisy. And so it's a blind spot that Peter needed confronting. And that's what happens. So Paul confronts him to his face and says, hey, you, sir, are not being honest. Who is your Paul in your life? Who is the person that can come to you and say, let me tell you about yourself? Let me, let, me, let me show you where you've lost your way. Who is the person in your life that can, can pull you aside and say you're not being consistent? You said this, but you're doing that. There's that moment in your life when you realize if you're not careful, you have no one. Now, guys like me, if we're not careful, we won't have that voice because we won't let that voice in. You're the pastor, you're the CEO of the company, you're the whatever person in charge, and you don't have anybody around you that's a Paul that can stop you, pull you over, and make you stop. You need that. We all need that. I work for that. I invite that into my life. Now, everybody can't participate because everybody's not qualified. They're giving me their perspective from where they sit. Jesus often would correct people who saw things from where they sit and think that's the world's view. It's not. Who's your Paul who can courageously confront you and get you to pause? Second thing, I want you to look at this. There is there is this statement that Paul makes to Peter that not only confronts him, but confirms something. You've been infected, he says. Look at verse verse 13. The other Jews joined in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. In other words, he says, Peter, what you've done has become infectious. What you do now, you have other people doing it. So it's not just that you're out of sync. You're leading other people to be out of sync. Everybody's getting messed up. So Paul courageously confronts this infection. And, and, and that's important to do. When something infects your family, man, wow. You've got to say something. you got to say, you know, this is not us. This is, a, this is an infection. Paul says, like, well, what are we doing? Now you're running from all the Gentiles when the Jews show up right from Jerusalem. And now you act like you don't know these people. Now you're running around. You're acting like, OK, I don't talk to them. They're not really my friends. He says that's and now Barnabas is being carried away in the same hypocrisy. Then he goes on and says this. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Can I just point out, Peter, you're not being consistent? And he doesn't do it in private. Sometimes embarrassing moments are good for you. Some of my most learning, growing moments came in front of people. It's one of the things about preaching. Get in front of people. It can be embarrassing. I will not tell all the stories I know in my brain, but there have been many embarrassing moments. And in those moments, I have to 
find truth and grow. So Paul confronts Peter, shows him he's been infectious, and then he teaches him a principle, something that's an old theological principle called justification by faith. The point he wants to make to Peter is, listen, you're not going to be justified by who you hang around, whether it be a Jew or a Gentile. You're thinking wrong, Peter. Here's what he said in verse 15. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know, here's what we know, that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put on, put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Nobody. You guys are trying to fulfill some law in your mind. That's why you're acting this way. And he says, please understand, you're not justified by, by being only with Jews. You're not justified because you go to the synagogue. You're justified by your faith in Christ. The same way these Gentiles are justified. It's not about your ethnic, hanging with your own ethnic group or your own religious group. You're not justified because you're a Catholic or a Baptist or because you are Presbyterian or whatever. You're justified because of your personal commitment to Jesus Christ, because he's the one who forgives you. Verse 17 says, but in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the, the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promises, promotes sin? No, absolutely not. If I rebuild what I've destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. Bottom line is, is I'm not going to, I don't need to have faith just in my Jewishness. I need to have faith in Christ. If I'm seeking to be justified in my Jewish nature, in my Jewish title, he says, but if seeking to be justified, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners. He says, when you really look at it, you being a Jew didn't make you perfect. You're a sinner too. You struggle too. There are things flying in your life, flying over your head, things that come at you that affect your life. It's like a helicopter flying over your life. Sin, things, things, things. Just because you're a Jew doesn't mean that you get away from that. The things flying around you. And one thing that's important is to remember that Christ died for you. All this is to promote a courageous conversation about their faith. Because at the end of the day, if they were willing to open their eyes and see, he says, let me show you one final point. Here's what he says. In verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might be lived for God. I've been crucified with Christ and I'm no longer and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I live by faith. Paul says, let's have a conversation so we're clear. Number one, let's be clear that you're being a hypocrite. Number two, let's be clear that you're acting like because you separate from me with these Jews that you're right with God, but Jews aren't perfect. Let's be clear that your justification comes from trusting Christ and walking by faith, trusting him. You're not perfect, and so you need to stop acting this way because it's hypocritical. Gentiles aren't perfect, but Jews aren't either. It's a point he wants to make so everybody's clear. Whether you be a Baptist, a Methodist, Catholic, black, white, Asian, doesn't matter. I'm not more righteous because I'm black. I don't worship blackness. I, I don't worship my, my religion. I don't worship my clothing. I, don't, I understand that is all wrong. And that leads me to the next series. We're going to talk about going in the wrong direction next time we talk. Because that's what happened with them. And Paul in the book of Galatians was trying to, from chapter one all the way to chapter six, I'm trying to get these guys going in the right direction. I'm trying to get their minds out of the flesh. I'm trying to get them to stop trusting in their ethnicity and trust Jesus. I'm trying to get them to believe that you're not better than or worse than because you're white, black, Asian, whatever you are. Please understand it's all about him. He died. He's the one who gave us life. It's in him. Obeying the law doesn't make you right. You can get everything right, walk right, do right, pray right, intercede right, speak in tongue, not speak in tongue, fall out, lay out, don't matter. It's who he is. That's the priority. 
And if you don't get in your mind the real focus and you walk in willful blindness and ignore the truth and, and just walk around thinking, oh, I, I, I'm right because I go to church. Oh, I'm right because I'm a black man. And I was treated wrong by the white people and I'm, and I'm a white man. I'm right. Oh, no, you're not right because you're anything. You're right because he made you right. He justifies you. He's the one who says you're right with God. That is the bottom line of the entire book. And here's what happens if you're not careful. You will ignore all of that and go in the wrong direction. So next time I'm going to talk about that. Why do people go in the wrong direction? If you remember when we said to you as a question at the beginning of the year that I ask everybody, right? And the one question I deal with all year long, here's the question. Why, why in the world do people not do what they say they're going to do? The first month I told you that they are trapped in the wrong place. Sometimes people are trapped in the wrong place. And because they're trapped in the wrong place, they never do what they say they're going to do. Second time I said that they're, they're trapped in injustice. Sometimes injustice, is, and sometimes it's not your fault. It stops you from doing what you're supposed to do. This country is supposed to have a better racial history than this. But injustice reigned for 246 years in our country. There was this incredible, incredible long period of slavery and abuse. And, and then a longer period, some almost 100, another 100 years of women, no women's rights and just all kind of stuff. That was a waste of time. As a country, we didn't have time for that. Trapped in injustice stops you from becoming all you can be. How many years did you waste? Then thirdly, we talked about being trapped financially. That for some people, that was the issue. It's your money. Your money has been funny for a long time and you just been all over the place worrying about money, trying to get a job, trying to get more money, trying to save, trying to pay your debt off. I mean, it's incredible. And then we talked about last month, this month, trap. you're trapped and you never get to where you're supposed to be. You never do what you say you're going to do because you operate in willful blindness. But now I want to turn to another fifth answer to the question. Why people go in the wrong direction? Why people don't do what they say they're going to do. It's because they go in the wrong direction. What direction are you going in? If you're going in the wrong direction, it's going to be tough. And there are three simple things I want to leave you with. We'll talk about over the next three weeks. The first reason people go in the wrong direction is because they have bad examples. A bad example. I don't know who and where you learned it, but we'll talk about this next week our next time together. Next week, I got a treat for you, but the following week, next month, I got another treat for you. Talk about bad examples. Next reason is because they have bad advice. <laughs> Somebody gives them bad advice. You listen to bad advice and you end up going in the wrong direction. Thirdly, because of what I call bad cultural habits. We develop unhealthy cultural traditions and it's why we have the trouble we have. You know what? You know what? Diabetes and all these things are sometimes um, prevalent in families because you teach them to eat like a person who to catch diabetes. You eat, you cook food and you prepare food. Nobody works out. Nobody tries. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I have to watch all my numbers, try to keep myself healthy. And it's amazing what I'm learning. But because some of us are in cultures, cultures, get this right here, that promote bad habits. So everybody in the family is gaining too much weight. Don't you turn that off. Everybody, the children, everybody. Everybody, nobody exercises. Everybody spends money. Everybody gets in debt. Everybody sleeps around. Everybody, everybody does everything. Drinks, drugs, everybody. Bring it on. We all drink, drug, and do everything. So these habits lead to bad results. And nobody has that courageous moment when you say, we need to have a courageous conversation about this and look at our direction as a family. Sometimes you never thought about it, but it's time to think about it. Got a lot to say. Next week, I got a special treat for you. Young people gonna be up, don't miss them. <laughs> they got a special word to get you going in the right direction, but that's next week. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for those who've heard this message today. May it bring life and healing to them. I pray they would inspire them to have that courageous conversation and not walk in willful blindness, but to launch their hearts and minds to a new place. I pray for healing. I pray for grace. And I pray for strength. I thank you for your healing touch. 
I pray for those who don't know you as Savior, never gave their lives to Christ, never made this decision. They've been going in the wrong direction. Let this be a moment of healing for them. And I pray, God, that they would open their hearts and minds to your transforming power. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I pray you see now and you're with me now. I don't know who the Paul is in your life who pulled you aside and said, hey, we need to talk about that. And they challenge you to see things differently. Thank God you didn't run them off. Sometimes that can be the difference between success and failure, listening, opening your heart to insights from someone around you. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to talk about courageous conversations. Some of us need to have a conversation with somebody and some of us need to be conversated with. We need someone to talk to us. Help us be open to both sides of that. I pray, God, that you would give us wisdom today to take what we've heard and apply it to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Pastor Ricky Temple. Thanks for being with me today. See you next time on demand. We got more stuff to talk about down the road, so I'll see you then. Bye-bye.